Hi everyone, this is Immigration Lawyer John Kasrabi. Thank you for joining what is a late night session of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast for those listening live, episode number 194. We're gonna be going over just news for last month since April 25th to today, May 25th, events that happened in the immigration world, uh, recap. So I have a couple of different segments I'm gonna do regular. One is these recaps I do, which go over the news. Uh, secondly, I'm gonna go back to doing you know thoughts on you know, I got to figure out a better title for this, but thoughts on law and stuff like new legal stuff I learned. That's general education only, not intended for individual legal advice. And uh, it just, I think it helps practitioners because all these little things that we pop up that we're not sure about, and two of which I got to write down right now to mind. What is, what is work that came up again? And then there's another one, I forgot what it was, but I'll, I'll remember. Just talking about this stuff that practitioners like to talk about. Um, we have our interviews. They would have a segment, as always, with Kevin Gregg about uh, you know new court cases. Got to record that pretty soon. And um, Nadine Heights is tech. We're probably gonna do a session with her. Uh, it's, it's all this normal kind of stuff. But uh, you know, before we get started, I want to uh, remind everybody and just announce actually the second issue of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine was published. Uh, I love doing it. It's a lot of work, and a lot of colleagues um, really participated and helped out. I think we have like. I don't know, 18 articles, maybe 20 or something like that. Uh, definitely check it out by going to immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com slash magazine. Check out issue two. It, you're going to learn a lot either way, uh, either type of practice you do. This is going to be information that helps you at the beginner, intermediate, or even some of these expert level too. Uh, so that's fun. Next issue is coming out in a couple months. I want to thank all the sponsors, uh, particularly, as always, DocuWise who supports the podcast. And also, uh, you know, supports the magazine. DocuWise, you get additional 10% off their annual plan if you use uh, the, the code I have. So just go to DocuWise.com slash immigration dash lawyers dash podcast or immigration dash lawyers dash toolbox. Both of those work. And type in the URL that thing that you use. So if you went to DocuWise.com slash immigration lawyers toolbox, immigration dash lawyers dash toolbox, use the code immigration lawyers toolbox. I think there's spaces in there um, to get that code. If it doesn't work, just email them. I'm sure they'll hook you up. Uh, and, and do that. And you know we have a lot of new sponsors too. One of them I want to mention is FIS Web. They do um, multiple things. Uh, primarily, you might know them as uh, they do education evaluations, which are really needed. They're on that certified list that's recognized by USCIS uh, of, of these people that could review you know, um, degrees and stuff, put it there and they translate themselves and they have expert opinions too. So if you're doing you know, uh, employment-based cases and not employment sometimes too, uh, these are the things that could really help you. Translations for not employment, but especially for perm and stuff when you gotta make sure these evaluations of their education are proper, they're a really good resource. I wanna thank them supporting and adding an article. We'll, we'll have to do an interview with them so you get more familiar with the work they do and how to, to get involved with them. Now, um, a couple of housekeeping notes on my end. If you're listening, leave a five-star review, uh, leave a positive view on iTunes or wherever you can. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, I have two conferences I'm going to be speaking at. Uh, one of them is uh, on June 20, uh, June 2nd, which is coming up actually pretty soon right next week. The Rome District of Ayla is putting together a seminar, and this one's called, um, well, essentially, I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, we have three or four lawyers, each of them, uh, we picked like 15 or 12, 12 to 15 tips. And we're just spending uh, like almost an hour, uh, one tip a minute and just bam, 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 practice and, and tips of various kinds. So it's gonna be really good. If you're in Rome district, you're gonna enjoy that watching that. And then I'm at the Ella conference, Wednesday, June 9th. Um, I'm at a conference called Up Your Game, New Marketing Techniques for 2021. Uh, you know, with Katia Kiros, uh, we did an interview with her. Uh, Greg Siskin was gonna cover the first episode. Also, uh, Kate Lincoln, Goldfinch, and I'm going to be there talking about all the stuff that we do. So check it out. See you. I'm not going to see you live, unfortunately. It's not one of those years, but I'm going to see you digitally. At For those who are joining the conference June 9th, definitely come by. We're going to, we're going to talk more about this kind of stuff. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is that, uh, you know, the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox originally started with a, you know, educational program where I have hundreds and hundreds of videos that are like one or two minutes that I did every day for a year, a year and a half, just, just pouncing these videos, just getting out there and CLE sessions. And you get, you know, buy a subscription, you go in the, lot, in the library and get it. And I got so busy at the library, I had to put a halt on that because I wanted to keep updating stuff on there. The magazine, it just takes too much time. I couldn't do both of them. But I have a lot of people contact me wanting the subscription. And the, and the, the library had both marketing material and legal material, but now I'm really focused on legal there. But a lot of people are asking about the marketing part of it. So 
I have a course that's a really expensive course that uh, I, I don't advertise that much. If people really know me or ask me about it, I do it. But I thought maybe I'll do a, like an hour call once a month and talk about what I'm doing marketing and stuff and have the community on the phone like that. And that'll bring the price down a lot if there's multiple people on a group call as opposed to individually. So if you're interested in that, let me know. If I see, you know, we get enough people to make an hour, you know, a week, you know, worth it financially for me and time and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Uh, because we have, you know, three or four people that have asked uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and there's a couple people last for the months, so but I can't find the emails of who they were. So if you are interested in having a, a, a you know like a marketing call where I just talk about the things I'm doing, and I'm, I'm doing pretty well marketing wise, I really um, get to get tons of potential cases. I just don't accept them because I'm, I'm really my primary goal is education nowadays and doing these kind of programs. Uh, I need you know I like helping people and I like immigration, but. Uh, I can't do those hardcore cases like I used to. I just turned down a great EB1A this morning uh, because it does take too much time. I don't like doing uh, i 75 ones when there's a waiver needed because those take a lot of time. I stopped doing regular 6-1 waivers years ago. All this stuff takes too much time and you know, reading and educating and talking is, is really key. So that's a lot of the housekeeping stuff. With that, let's get it started. Let me share the screen if you're watching live, if I can remember how the button works for it. Uh, give me two seconds to figure out how this button's supposed to work so you can see my screen. Uh, on this program, okay, let's see. No, that's not it. Hmm. I remember they had a live button where you could uh, we could see your screen. So you may not see my screen, you just be looking at me reading the news. We got some people watching live through right now, so you can leave a comment on this app if you're watching. Uh, but oh yeah, share screen, share screen, share screen. Yes, uh, share. All right, so well, we're sharing. Oh my, there's a million screens that within each other. What do I do? <laughs> is that it? What's going on? Why is this? Oh, okay. Let's change it like that. All right. Oh, I can't see me on the side, maybe, or how does that work? Well, I'm not sure how you're seeing me right now because I just changed the screen, but um, yeah, we'll just keep it like it is. Right? Okay. So if you are going to leave a comment, I'm not going to be able to see, I think, what's going on. So um, <laughs> let me let me see. All right. So we'll, we'll figure it all out. Um, live events happen like this all right so um let's go to news so uk added india to travel ban list and it got hit hard with a lot of the coronavirus kind of stuff and uh it's a big issue uh because not only did uk do it i think a lot of other countries did including the united states and you know it sucks because india was already backlogged with the and then a lot of people on h1b's and l's couldn't get their visas now this comes and gets hit with it there's just tons of tons of cases backing up. I have so many Indian couples calling me with the F2A, uh, IR, I mean, relative case even that just are not going forward. Uh, it's a disaster. Uh, it's very sad to see what's going on there. And Pakistan, um, Canada also banning Pakistan. Canada's really hardcore when it comes to this uh, right now on blocking and, and people coming there. Just a second, let me close my window right here. I got to hear a cricket. I'm not sure if you guys can hear it distracting me a little bit all right so coming back to it dhs issues notice of suspension of requirement governing employment for syrian and venezuelan student f1 students so this is really important if you're an f1 student um and you have these financial kind of problems uh hey ibrahim um you uh you could potentially uh get a work because you're from one of these countries which typically is really rare to the push but it's something to do but you got to tell these students it's hard when you're a lawyer's practitioner to tell them the beforehand come to you. I can't count how many times people do paid internships while on F1 don't realize they're supposed to get, you know, CPT or something like that to do that uh, or special permission. So it kind of sucks. On the bright side, if, you, if you're vaccinated, Europe opened its doors and says we're going to accept travelers in the summer coming in. Um, you know, I really want to travel myself, but I got my 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 uh my COVID is two little kids that scream and yell and ruin trips. So I don't know if I'll go, but if uh, it gets a vacation in there. Now uh, we have a post here. Andrew Wilson, one of our contributors as well, so to, to the magazine says new appointment process for USMCA. That's the old NAFTA agreement. That's called USMCA now. Uh, what does it say for TNs and L1s of the Peace Bridge? The Peace Bridge recently announced a new appointment process for for NAFTA TNs and L1s. Uh, information regarding making appointment for applications at the Port of Buffalo is listed on the CBP website. So they have just be careful, new systems and stuff uh, for TNs and Ls at the border. Uh, another interesting thing, uh, Daniel Horn, one of the one of the top people on LinkedIn who posts really good stuff, said uh, he, he posted an article by Slate about what happens to the government's immigration um, technological system, and he he copy pastes. Uh, I mean, he has a note here. It says seven years into development. The first design of the system, ELIS-1, 
was such a dysfunctional mess that USCIS was forced to scrap it and start again. Another four years and a total $1 billion later, the USCIS had managed to digitize just two of the 95 forms that they use. So it's, it's a disaster. That's where we find where all this money, money went, where USCIS needs to raise fees and they're going bankrupt. Um, it's a disaster uh, to see that you know they can't get it together um, on these kind of situations. Uh, it, it's such a difficult uh, thing to, to, to deal with uh, when, when you have these kind of issues uh, involved. And they can't just you know solve it. I mean, the same thing happened with the healthcare.gov kind of situation uh, where they um, couldn't get the website done, but that was done. And I just I don't understand why it takes a billion dollars to make a website. Nonetheless, it sounds kind of you know I'm not a tech guy. Maybe there's a reason for that, but it sounds kind of crazy that he's a billion dollars making a website. So I don't know. Uh, so yeah, India's situation with mission essentially mission India is closed except for rare stuff. Israel is open and closed, not much better. A lot of the world is still the same situation, even if the trial events are gone. All right, breaking news, USCIS issues policy guidance of deference to previous decisions. So this is was a great piece of news that came out last month, the end of last month. Because uh, if you're, especially if you're a business practitioner renewing an L or H, we were getting uh, uh, RFEs and denials on previously approved cases for new issues. And this was one of the disasters of the Trump administration. But now they're going back to the old policy of deference, which wasn't always full deference. They're not just going to like not like review a case, but not go so hardcore as to re-review the whole thing, which is one of the reasons it caused massive delays, I imagine. Uh, but we got to fix other stuff too with this, this whole system. I'm going to get to it uh, in a second, but on when L2s and, and uh, H4s and all that kind of stuff, how ridiculous. It took me one year, one, I was going to say goddamn year, GD year <laughs> for uh, uh, an L2 to be approved. Uh, after the L1 was approved, and they were both ex the second extension, and they are feed at first the L2 saying show proof that the L1 was approved essentially, and it's like don't you know that that's in your system? We jointly filed this. Why would you do something like that? So, 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 so. <laughs> now one note is from from our previous issue of the Immigration to Us magazine, Brian Manning, uh, one of the former consular officer, former asylum officer, now does private practice as an as an asylum attorney. Uh, he had an issue, an article listed how to make the asylum officer love you, your client, and you before sitting foot in their office. So definitely check that out in the first issue of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine. And we did a, a CLE to a one-hour CLE, really breaking this stuff down as well. If you're interested in that, just email me. I'll send you a link to, to purchase that. Uh, DHS announces new guidelines that limits ICE and CBP civil enforcement actions in or near courthouse. Well, hallelujah. I can't believe we have to like, do an order for that. Um, Immigration advocates say end of no match letters of victory for workers. So this is what Chicago Sun-Times article. Apparently, uh, the no match letters are what Social Security sees that like or whoever does um, checking sees that the Social Security number they posted does not exist or something like that's a match person's name. Um, they tell the worker and stuff. It might create problems. And it seems like they're stopping doing that. A DHS to make additional 22,000 temporary non-agricultural workers uh, visas available. That's really good. And I follow a guy on the TikTok app and uh, he's a Sheoahi, I think is his name. He's a farmer. He has several farms in the West Coast and he flies to them and stuff. And he was showing how much of his land, how much of his farm that had, uh, you know, product ready to go to be picked up and go, uh, had to go to waste. You know, it seemed probably like tons of money and tons of food um, because he couldn't get the workers to the United States. So it was a complete disaster. All right, national interest exceptions for certain travelers from China, Iran, Brazil. So they increase, the State Department keeps updating this on their site about who, who falls in exemptions and, and all that kind of stuff. But we have some good stuff. Certain countries that are banned could get F1 still. The fiance visa opened up, so they're given priority as well. But having said all of this, I have cases that are not getting interviews. And as you know, the embassies aren't actually many times open or scheduling interviews. So it doesn't matter if... Um, they, you know, the bans are gone. Practically speaking, um, that's not happening. Now, we have a job posting from last month. Let's see. If, let's see if it's still there and what firm it was. This is Whitman Walker Health, um, probably some in-house counsel position for immigration lawyer. Bi I'm not even sure what kind of business they are, but uh, they want a bilingual immigration attorney. Uh, so Whitman-Walker Health, check that out. Or just always subscribe to the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox LinkedIn page, and we post these as it as it come up. Now, Wads and Bandits, we bring this uh, this firm up a lot to uh, litigation, immigration attorneys going to federal court constantly, having great successes. Uh, in a deposition, they tweeted, uh, deposition hot takes, USCIS at Texas Service Center has 22 people assigned 
to deny extensions for people who left the country. So when you do a B2 extension, leave the country, it has 18 people assigned to all other I-539s. And so this is a complete disaster. I'm going to talk about this again in the other episode, too, because I'm going to be clips of that. Uh, I-539, B-2, EOS, travel. Now, this is a, a, a tricky situation, because actually right now, with a lot of people are not going home. Let's say you file a B-2 extension. It's pending. Three or four months go by. Maybe five or six, seven months go by. Still no decision. And then people say, you know, I'm just going to leave. Now, let, let's take out the six or seven month scenario. Let's say it just they will ask for four months. After two months, they leave on their own. What happens to the case? Um, is it considered abandoned? Well, technically, I guess, I guess it could be abandoned. Uh, but colleagues have said they mailed like flight tickets to USCI saying they left. Please just approve the extension up to the date of leaving. And that way they don't have any overstay. It doesn't invalidate their visa as well. Uh, but here um, in that position, they're saying B2 extension to left country has 18 people assigned. Uh, so that's 22 people assigned to deny B2 extensions for people out of the country and 18 people assigned to all other I-539s. So when you're wondering why I-539 is taking seven or eight months, they're putting most of their time on just denying people for leaving. And it just, it's a bizarre situation, misallocation of resources most likely. I don't know all the details of what's going on there, but I'm not optimistic that it is proper. All right, so uh, one uh, law firm Chavez and Valco LLP says, we got a bunch of uh, positions open at a law firm, please share. So check out that. They got attorneys and paralegals, family removal, a business-based immigration. So there's a lot to, to check out there at Chavez and Valco. Now, one note is the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox Magazine. I did a whole page. Uh, it came out to half a page, but the job listing is there. So I want to make a job board in the magazine and the toolbox itself. So if you are thinking of hiring and stuff, uh, even paralegals, a lot of paralegals listen to and watch too. Uh, let me know you post it here. Try to create some sort of resource for people to pick up these jobs uh, when they're opened up. It seems like there's a lot of them happening. High court bars, multiple part deportation notices. So the whole situation, I think this is the NIS case, probably NIS Chavez. We're going to talk about it. Kevin Gregg, the Supreme Court decision, pushing back against the agencies saying, what the hell is going on with these, uh, you know, post these, these uh, NTAs that they're issuing. Now, there's an immigration associate position open in London at Fragman. Our colleague, Emily Allen, she's here in Southern California, posted this on a LinkedIn page. So if you're in London or if you want to move there, maybe and you got a work permit there. Uh, immigration Associate for U.S. Consular op uh, Operations, I guess, in London. would be an interesting thing to do. Now, um, I, I may have talked about it last time, but it's a disaster that American citizen and visa services at U.S. Consular Post in Russia will almost completely halt as of May 12, 2021. So the situation with case processing in Russia is a disaster. One tip, Poland is somewhat still accepting transfers of these cases. So if you haven't already, Give it a shot. Contact the U.S. Embassy in Poland and ask for a case transfer. They've been pretty good at doing it uh, like within a day or so, even have that quickly. The Biden administration has confirmed or restrict travel from India. Okay, we already talked about that. Here's another immigration law job that was posted. That was a Chavez of alcohol again. So that's, that's something to check out. Oh, uh, our, one of our colleagues, Reza Mazahari, he's in, I think he's in Nevada, had a great L1 case lawsuit that I challenged and won. I definitely recommend if you're doing L1 cases uh, to read it, especially if you're dealing with lawsuits, um, it, it, to use this kind of stuff. The name of the case is uh, Securitech Inc. V U S C I S. I'm not sure how much helps. Let me see if there's some number you could use. Um, case 220 CB 05462 KMJBC. <laughs> Sorry. If you really want it, just email me. I'll try to find it. But congrats to Reza for, for winning an L1 lawsuit. It seems that's the way to go. So, what I posted, on the AILA NMD listserv today about how frustrated they are when they have great EB1As. They even get three of the 10 criteria, but they get denied on Kazarian is making them want to just give up doing it. And frankly, it's one of the reasons I stopped doing it because, uh, you know, like you win eventually a lot of times, but you have to fight and fight and fight. That's like as a, as a full soul as I am with everything on my plate, it's hard for me to do. Maybe if I had a firm and stuff like that, and staff, I could do it. But, um, and a lot of people responded, that's why you got to sue them and that's the way to go. You got to sue, 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 sue. <laughs> you listen to hear it so much that it becomes normal to you. Uh, colleague Brian Zaccaro says Mexico and U.S. agree to extend the validity period of certain visa stamps. As a result, Mex Mexican citizens can obtain E1, E2, L1, L2 visas for up to 48 months and H1B and H4 visas for up to 36 months. Unfortunately, TN visa stamps are not extended beyond their current one-year validity period. So TNs, I think their first time is like three years, and is that, or I'm thinking about L1s. 
Um, TNs, I thought they're two year period. I'm, I only do Canadian TNs when I, I don't even do TNs that much anymore, but when I did, it was, it was Canadian. So, uh, maybe TN, uh, maybe Mexico has different reciprocity. Well, let me check it out. Let's go to reciprocity chart for Mexico and then let's go to their TN. Oh, what well, do they have TN? Uh, TN, okay, none. Validity of here 12 months. Oh, that sucks. Um, 12 months TN. Let me see if Canada is different or. The way they, they treat Canada and, and Mexico differently for TNs and how they can be processed, that's kind of a mess right there. <laughs> I don't know how justified that is. I mean, we give Canadian, Mexicans like the border crossing card, which is pretty easy coming go. So I don't know. That's a whole different thing. But it seems like if we give that, we could work with them on TNs as well. And so, yeah, Mexico. Oh, geez, it's true. So TN uh, Canada for, for Mexico is one year validity. But for uh, Canada, it's 36 months period of validity. So that's like, that's, that's crazy. I didn't know that. Oh man, that sucks. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next one. Another uh, was a banished tweet. USCIS confirms it will suspend biometrics for all H4 and L2 applications as of May 17th in a court filing. So, and they updated their fee schedule for this too. So if you're doing, and this is really important because this is where you, your checks might bounce and then comes back and then you have a late filing and creates a disaster. I think they updated the fee chart for this too. Uh, if you're doing an I-539 for an H-4 or an L-2, you don't have to do biometrics, so you don't have to pay the biometrics fee. So the fee schedule uh, for I-539s are not always going to have right now biometrics, and you got to check the fee for it. They just do this stuff. Don't really announce it. The only announcement I got was one is watching Twitter from the Wazirbanis tweet, and then a note from USCIS. Actually, they did say that they're – I think that they did a USCIS agency announcement, but um, they updated the fee schedule on it. And uh, just the fee schedule in general. So there's a notice that the USCIS fee schedule changed. I'm like, what changed? So I posted in a group and they're like, oh, you know, because there's no more uh, biometrics fee. They update that information on the fee schedule. A colleague posted that. I was like, oh, okay. So be mindful. Don't send the full fee for that one or else you're going to get messed up. All right. Third Circuit says BIA can close cases contrary to 2018 rule. A split Third Circuit ruled that the Board of Immigration Appeals and Immigration Judges have the authority to administratively close deportation proceedings, handing a win to a Mexican man hoping to renew his deferred action DACA or status after being freed criminal charges. So that's great. Uh, it's crazy that an immigration judge can't control uh, their docket and that we have to give them the, the power and the judgment to do these kind of things. Eighth Circuit says TPS grant does not constitute an admission. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's going to be crazy. We're going to see what the Supreme Court says about that. Um, this has been a different fact because the Supreme Court is hearing this. Eighth Circuit wouldn't make a decision if something's happening there. I think what's different here uh, about the admission aspect that's different from what the Supreme Court hearing is uh, this ruling was granting temporary status not considered an admission for cancellation of removal, uh, canceling removal proceedings. So that's a, a little different than uh, admission for adjustment of status. Or that, I think that was the issue uh, that's on the, on the Supreme Court is for canceling removal proceedings. So it's a different issue there. Third Circuit says immigration notice doesn't need hearing info on it. Um, does, is it? I thought the Supreme Court said it doesn't. Miss. What's going on? The Third Circuit on Wednesday shot down a native Guatemala's challenge to an immigration judge's jurisdiction over his case on the grounds that a referral notice initiating these proceedings did not have a date and time. So I don't know. I'll ask Kevin Gregg about this. Um, uh, EOIR announces 17 new immigration judges. Uh, that's, that's fun. Um, we'll see what happens with the backlog. And the H4, H1B issue in India, um, non-U.S. citizen parents of minor U.S. citizen children. Okay, non-U.S. citizen parents of minor U.S. citizen children, including parents holding valid H1B and H4 visas, are not subject to travel ban. So that's for India, just for, uh, for people to know. Uh, great news, DHS withdraws proposed biometrics rule. Oh, yeah, they had this crazy, crazy run of Trump where the petitioner joint sponsors. Everyone had to go and do biometrics and create havoc for everybody. It's just what a mess. Uh, Boston, BC, Boston College law students continue to impress as two teams argued cases in front of the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit earlier this month. One of them was approved. It was a natural, it was a citizenship case, which is very, I, I read the whole thing, but it was a very narrow decision. But I do want to send my best to both Boston College Law School, who did that, and uh, the, the attorney professor who was in charge, uh, Kari Hung, uh, who's a great friend the show is on. Uh, just uh, emailing her moments ago too. So it was a great success on that case. Um, okay, Niz, we're going to talk about that case uh, in our ne next meeting with Kevin Gregg. 
consolidated COVID. So the DOS, we the state, does have consolidated kind of guidance on this stuff. They constantly change it every day. So keep an eye on it and see what happens. Sometimes they change back and forth. It's kind of weird. Uh, the director of the nation's immigration court has stepped down. This is the guy that was leading him. Um, James McHenry's tenure, the Trump administration executed monumental, blah, blah, blah. James McHenry, the director of the nation's immigration court system, will step down from his leadership role at the end of the week, according to a memo from the Justice Department. DHS announces continuation of international entrepreneurial program. So you know, a lot of people were really excited about this the entrepreneurial program. I mean, I guess you can be excited, uh, you know, uh, let me see how that works. Um, but, uh, you know, how excited can you get in this, this program that's like really badly designed, very narrow, uh, very unclear, and who knows how long USCIS is going to take to adjudicate it. So my thing about this program is, you know, thanks for doing it, but let's create a real program, not this convoluted, you know, 200-page program explanation. Who knows what's going to be happening on that. Now, I haven't looked at this one too much, but apparently in later department pushes back H-1B wage hike until late 2020. I don't do H-1Bs, but apparently a lot to worry have about that. Another job opening at Matthew Galati's office. I think he's a Pennsylvania, great guy. There's a lot of UV-5s, so associate position there. Paralegal position at uh, Shear Immigration Law Firm. That's in Israel, so, uh, so check that out. Uh, Ayuda is hiring a staff attorney in Virginia office, so check out Ayuda. Uh, they're, uh, I think, they, you know, help migrate, stuff like that. Safe Pages Passage Project is hiring for that long. Island office, Lenny Benson posted that. Um, Sandra Club uh, immigration paralegal of Florida. So, so many, a lot of job openings for lawyers and paralegals happening. Um, so, so we'll see what happens there. The Visa Bulletin came out. I didn't really look at it too much. Uh, it didn't affect my cases, but um, that's uh, something to keep an eye out on. Uh, let's see what else. My magazine's out. Temporary protective status for Haiti came, uh, was extended. Oh, uh, for those who have uh, passports who recently expired, apparently you could use that to, to return to the United States if expiring outside without having to renew it. There's more nuance to that, but check out the Department of State if, if that issue pops up. Uh, potential federal funding of immigration defense lawyers. So they're trying to potentially pay for, you know, in civil proceedings where you don't usually have a right to attorney to, to create funding or something like that for right to attorney, which would include immigration because that's a civil proceeding. So that's something interesting to watch out for. We'll see how it affects our practices and just the practice of immigration law. Uh, let's see. And that's about it. Thank you so much for everyone listening. If you haven't already, you know, download the magazine, immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com slash uh, what is it? magazine. Leave a five-star review. Uh, let me know if you like or don't like these agency updates. I like to just recap the news and what's going on for myself. Uh, and we'll do a legal thought stuff. We'll do our interviews. We'll do talk about court. We're going to do it all. Because over here at the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox and Podcast, we love talking about immigration, in particular U.S. immigration. I'm very lucky to find a space where I could talk, uh, practice, a job, a career, where I talk about it all day, every day. I'm not getting tired. It's amazing. 11 years of nonstop talking about this stuff. And I still wake every day to do it. And that's pretty great. Um, it's very rare. So I would say immigration is a great practice. You just got to do it right not to get burned out. Uh, but uh, if you do it right, you make a good living and have a lot of fun with it, too. So with that, God bless everyone. Be safe. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.